So yeah, um, I'm very, very happy to introduce to our digital stage uh, Jean-Michel Selegier. I hope I said that properly. I tried so hard. Um, uh, they're a freelance researcher from France with a PhD in authoring temporal media, which I think I know what that is, but I hope it will explain a little further because it sounds super cool. Um, a fellow event organizer um, who, yeah, teaches creative coding to, um, yeah, doing the good work by also passing on the torch and teaching creative coding languages. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear what you have to say about creating interactive digital art with OSIA and OSIA Score and LibOSIA, right? Hey, so uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, perfect. So uh, hello, everyone. So I'm super glad to be here at this uh, Rust Fest. So um, I prefix my talk by saying that there isn't a lot of Rust elements in this. Uh, what I'm going to show is mostly C++, and we are trying to make inroads in Rust. So we have some small APIs that are putting a finger in the big uh, Rust um, I don't know the word in English, but the shape of the rest thing. Um, so yeah, so I'll just start directly by a small demonstration. And then we'll uh, discuss a bit what this is all about. Um, all right, so just first a small sound check. Can you tell me if you hear sound right now? Uh, we cannot. Okay, it starts. Great. Uh, let's just see, because of course um, I'm on Linux. <laughs> um, and audio is hard on any platform. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I, I'll just pump the sound of my loudspeakers. That worked. Okay. Here you should be hearing something. Yep. All right. Um, so some of you may know uh, music software like Cubase, Ableton, uh, Bitree, that kind of thing. So this is something kind of similar, but for in general, the whole uh, media art, art practice that is not only um, audio and music, but also video. Um, I, I, for instance, I saw that some previous talks uh, talked about um, creative coding environments such as uh, well, Nanu, which was a very nice presentation. Uh, the first concert we had, I think, used Open Sound Control in the um, uh, in the description. And all these media technologies we are trying to build at OSIA a free and open source sequencer, which is able to um, to automate them in a timeline. So. Um, it starts extremely simply. So for instance, you can just like most music software, put song and, uh, and play it. And if you've ever done music with a computer, that's nothing super interesting for, uh, for now. Um, you can have time stretch, which uh, means that you can change the speed of the sound and adjust the tempo depending on what you have, that kind of thing and you can apply effects. So we have some kind of effects which are supported, like some of you may know VST plugins or LV2 or Faust. So for today, I'm going to mostly use Faust. So Faust is a um, domain-specific programming language for um, signal processing, and which is, can be used to implement a lot of very common audio effects. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to put, say, a uh, delay on my sound. I, I just do that. Uh, connect the cable, and and I'll tell it to run. And this will apply some effects to the sound. I can also put some distortion. Um, so first, for instance, is the first interesting thing because um, a first program is basically source code. And here you can directly go and edit the source code and, uh, well, do some, some level of live coding with the software. So, um, and I'll show a bit all the various 
programming languages that are embedded in OSIUS core. And well, maybe one day there will be a rest too. At least that's something I hope to see uh, <laughs> in my lifetime. Um, so sound is a first thing. Uh, but then when you do media art, sometimes you have sound, but you also want to have some visuals. So how will visual works? Well, pretty much the same thing. You'd have some uh, video file and you'd drag and drop it. It appears in the timeline. And here you will see, you will say to the software, okay, let's add an output window in which we are going to be able to do some rendering. So rendering is hopefully efficient because it uses uh, all the um, nice technologies such as Vulkan, uh, that kind of thing. And so I hope we can see that the idea of the software is that you are going to be uh, able to assemble various kind of uh, media in a timeline in something that well is, is useful for media artists, whatever the kind of uh, medium they are using. Um, so for videos, we can, of course, just play a video like that, but we can, just like we can apply sound effects, we can also apply video effects. So what will be a video effect, for instance, um, let's see, uh, this one just is very simple and nice. It makes things black and white and as someone who listen to a lot of metal music. I like black and white. I don't know if it's correlated or something. Um, so here we can see that the same video is having some kind of live effect applied to it, which can be useful if you do uh, VJing, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so um, that's the core idea of this part. Um, then you'll notice that things are looping. Um, on every medium, you can say, okay, this is going to, to loop forever. So here, for instance, by default, both uh, rhythmic samples, which are kind of detected with heuristics and videos are set for looping because this is something which experimentally, when working with users, we found something they want to do. They just want to, to work with uh, various kind of materials and have them running in kind of infinite loop while they tweak the effects and that kind of, that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Um, so, but then once we have um, audio and video, so one thing is that if you were using, say, uh, Cubase, you write, uh, you, 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 you hit a export button and it gives you a, either a video file or a, a MP3 file where, which you can just send to your friends. But, uh, in the title of this talk, the keyword is interactive. And interactive is basically that uh, we want to write a score where someone can write down inside the score, I want this thing to happen in response to something else. So for instance, um, if I press a button on my computer, I want things to advance, to go to the next part of the song or something like that. Um, so there are two ways to see interactivity. The first one, which is using, for instance, live sensors, for, such as, let's say, uh, keyboard controllers, that kind of thing. And the second one, which is um, directly saying in the score, okay, I want uh, this to react to, to that. So we'll start uh, very simply with, for instance, I'll start by adding a MIDI keyboard. So um, something with knobs that I can uh, just tweak. Uh, how will that look? So my keyboard is um, that little thing. And on that little thing, I can say, okay, let's learn what are the nodes that I'm going to use. Okay. And in this part of the software, you'll be able to see basically all the um, external controls that you want to be using in your score. So here I can just say, okay, um, let's say um, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. And from then, up, let's see. Uh, uh, so I don't know if you can see, for instance, yes, here we can see things move bits. 
So you can use physical controllers to, to trick things. But um, MIDI keyboards, they actually, they are not very good because they uh, only have very, very limited precisions. It's like seven bits. Seven bit is really not a lot. It goes from zero to 127. You can hack a bit your way to have more precision, but maybe you want to use, you know, some kind of more expressive device. So I have one of those devices right here, which is a plain old joystick. And here I can say, okay, let's add my joystick to this core. And here you should be able to see that uh, when I press stuff on my joystick, then I also have um, the controls of my joystick that are available for controlling things. So for instance, I could, uh, let's say, control some part of my sound with, um, with my joystick too. Up, and this one here. Okay. And here that gives me much more precision because joystick is, uh, well, it, it just has better bit depth. So, so we can have more expressive moves and that kind of thing. Um, so another thing that we may want to do is uh, actually what people like to do in like music videos and that kind of thing. It's using the sound to control uh, video effects. So for this, uh, I'll add another effect after the first one, something which does like some RGB, um, fun RGB stuff. And here we'll say, okay, the shaking of the thing, it will depend on our kick. Uh, so how would we do that? So now this is getting a bit into what we call visual programming. So earlier in the previous talk, I heard the word pure data. So uh, if you know pure data, well, you, you won't be lost because it's fairly similar, but in a timeline, instead of just being one graph, it's basically all the potential graphs that can happen during the score. Uh, so here I have all the objects that I can add to the software and I just able to say, okay, let's take my sound and compute its envelope, basically compute how loud is the sound at each instant. And then we can try to uh, map it to all this and let's see what this gives. Okay, so not a lot happens because um, the, the sound is not very loud. So what we have to do is to say, okay, I want to multiply this value by, by something. Uh, multiplication is quite useful operation, I'd say. And so we can just do things like this, which will... Um, Here it doesn't appear to be quite synchronized because of that delay effect, but if I do that instead, okay. Here we can see that things go pretty crazy whenever there is a kick in the... So and you, you can live edit all the operations, that kind of thing, and that, that's the thing because it, it's also meant for, you know, live, um, live creation. Um, so that's the basic, the core idea of the software. You have this timeline and then you have uh, the graphs within timeline. And if you want to edit things more precisely, you, you can just go and see things in a very um, graph way. So if you are, you are used to say touch designer or that kind of thing, then you will feel at home. And then you, you can go back to the timeline view to score things in time. All right. Um, so now what we may want to do is um, things such as, as I mentioned, uh, putting some level of interactivity in timeline. Like I want to say, okay, I, I want to move on from this part of the song whenever um, something happens. So if something right now will be just a uh, sound playing, uh, not, not something, uh, will be me pressing a button on my joystick. So um, let's say this one. So here I'm pressing button and well, just a Boolean value. And what I can do is say, um, okay, 
something like that, is say, okay, I want, whenever this changes, I want to move on from this part to the next part. And this is just done by dragging and dropping things. And if I hit play, now I can move on to the next part. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, then what I can say is uh, whenever we are done with that, okay, let's go back to where we were at the beginning. So we can write some kind of um, state machines with timeline. And uh, the visual language has basically elements to say um, some parts must keep running. This is when things are dashed. And uh, some things cannot be interrupted. So if, if, we, if I have dashes here, it means that I can cut and uh, have my event interrupt this part of the timeline at any moment. But here, I cannot interrupt my uh, timeline. It means that it's the score. I really want these parts to, to go on entirely before moving on to the next part. And well, this feels your languages. Um, enables writing scores where you have things that have various duration depending on whenever it happens and that's necessary when you're working for instance with, with humans on a stage play or something like that humans they don't take uh, two minutes and 37 seconds to do something they take something approximative and we have to have tools that allow us to have some leeway depending on what is actually happening on stage and uh, react to that as soon as we can <laughs> Um, okay, um, so another thing that uh, we often see in this kind of environments is uh, automation. So an automation is just something that will make uh, a control change over time. So here I can say, okay, I want to automate this and this creates an automation curve. And if I hit play, then uh, this parameter will go from 0 to 1 to 0 0.5 and change things in the in the rendering. But uh, the original uh, raison d'être of the environment was to um, control other software. So, uh, for instance, uh, I mentioned the OSC protocol, open sound control, which is um, fairly common in all kinds of media art software, like most uh, environments for creative coding, generative art, um, digital and intermedia art, they all support OSC. And um, at some point uh, we went and um, it was an initiative led by uh, Vidvox of uh, VDMX fame, a very famous video software. Uh, there was this OSC query protocol, which allows one software to discover what uh, kind of OSC nodes other software have. So uh, OSIA can, for instance, be used as a way to um, go and control other software and score them in time, just like it can score its own parameters. How will that look? So I'll give an example, for instance, with um, pure data. Uh, so. Um, if you don't know Pure Data, it's um, a, a system made by Miller Perkett, who also made MaxMSP in the 80s, uh, which is one of the most used uh, free and open source graph systems for um, well, making artworks and uh, that kind of thing. Um, okay. So in Pure Data, uh, what we can do is, well, we have all these little boxes, which are all, um, objects which perform some operation like uh, minus 20 plus 100, blah, blah, blah. And we have special objects which say, okay, this is an OSIA parameter. And this parameter will be available with all the metadata that it gives on the network. Uh, on the network, that means that we can uh, do something like uh, this, and we can just go and see a JSON um, that will give us what are all the parameters of this uh, uh, pure data patch. And then we'll be able to um, go and score them in OSIA. So here I can see all the available uh, OSC query devices on my network and uh, with their parameters. So here I can just send something to my PD patch and my PD patch, it could be on another 
uh, computer will start doing stuff. And this allows to do things like, uh, for instance, saying, uh, okay, um, saying that I want, first, I don't want to play, so I'll just drag and drop the current state here in the timeline, uh, like this. And uh, then at some point in the score later, I actually do want to start playing. And then a bit after I, I, I'm done, and uh, let's say in between, I can say, okay, I want to automate this parameter, so I just need to drag and drop it and write some automation curve that will change things. So I'll just, um, I'll just move that because we don't need it for now. So you can synchronize multiple things. And so for instance, pure data is a first example. Another one is processing. Processing is a bit similar, but much older than Nano, the framework that was shown in the first talk. And it's a framework to create mostly visuals. You can also do other things, but most people use it for creating a visual generative art. And so here we have um, a... Uh, A uh, Java, so processing is uh, written in Java, and you, you write your, your code in Java, just like with Nano, you write it in Rust. And um, it says, okay, let's draw, um, let's draw a rectangle uh, of a given size with a given color. And this size and this color, it comes from, it will come from OSIA parameters. So here too, I'm able to go here and say, okay, processing, add, and uh, I'll just move my window here. So it's this window. And here, it basically, my parameter will be the size of this little square. So if I put 50, uh, of course. So it draws over every time. And if I say, okay, my first color is 255, then it will do what, what we expect. And so here we, we can also automate things to give, um, for instance, some visibility to what is happening. So here, let's say that we want, okay. Oh, and here I, I will say, okay, you are going from zero to 1,000. And here we see our thing growing, but that's not enough. Uh, what we want is also to change its color. And for this, we can also uh, do some color automation. Uh, let's put it like right here. We can even uh, load some presets. There are some color presets and say, okay, I want this to uh, go and hit the color. And here you can see that it sends the color over OSC to the um, processing patch. Uh, okay. uh, it sends the color to the processing patch and well, those what you expect. So you, you can also say, okay, uh, let's um, repeat this forever. Let's loop this um, for as long as we can. And yeah, it will just uh, do um, repeat the gradient from beginning to end. And uh, yeah, so basically score is an environment and OCI is an environment for um, scoring a lot of creative apps together. Um, so yeah. And I have roughly 10 minutes running, so I'll um, explain a bit uh, more in detail. Um, so um, to give an idea of what can be done with it, so is there are some uh, images from artworks that use Azure Score, Libosia, or both in their creation. So installation work, um, plays, uh, dance, music, um, video art, uh, we do a lot of uh, sound specialization, 
uh, work with robots, for instance, um, making robots dance depending on what happens on stage. Um, some artists use it for uh, modular, for instance, uh, modular setups. Oh, you can use different plans also. As soon as you have some sensor, for instance, you can directly send data to Arduino. It supports sending uh, raw data to serial port. Uh, that can happen. Um, so this one is very fun. It, it was. Uh, one of my favorite projects, it's a uh, carousel where every seat is basically a musical instrument and people are supposed to all play together and the software tries to <laughs> make it fit semi-correctly. So yeah, uh, so here is a quick data sheet of um, OSIA. It's free and open source. Um, so um, it's C++, modern C++, but still not Rust. Um, Actually, when it was started in 2014, the, it was a big question, should we like uh, directly go for Rust or take the safe bet at the time? And uh, one big thing that uh, was missing was uh, the UE story at the time. And even today, I'm not sure there's something as extensive as Qt. We, we use Qt for the user interface and uh, it brings a lot and uh, it allows to do a lot very easily, I think. And uh, it is built with a plugin-based architecture, which is every part of the um, software, um, really, really every part, even the central view, all the menus, left, right, everything here, it's all uh, brought together through plugins, um, which for now are in C++. So of course, C++ has its <laughs> stability problems, um, and uh, it will be, I think, uh, really beneficial to have uh, to start to see how we could integrate uh, plugins with um, Rust. So, um, but I mentioned, I think, live coding, and uh, I got a bit too much ahead because this makes me think of one thing. Uh, we can also script, for instance, with, so we can embed um, pure data patches directly in vScore, and uh, this will open PDF. It doesn't crash because it's still experimental. Yeah. And um, can say, okay, um, let's send some notes. I'm sorry, it's, it's going to be ugly. Okay, it was very fast. Uh, so uh, this is sending things to, um, oh, okay. This is sending things to pure data, and I will want this to loop. Okay. Here I can directly edit my pure data patch, and when it loops, it's much. Uh, so I change this parameter, and you can basically control things either from here or from the PD patch. This is done thanks to. Thanks to the PD. So that's one way to do live coding. You can also do it with uh, JavaScript. So for instance, you can add some um, JS script here. And you can say, okay, I want to, uh, to have some noise, that kind of thing. And uh, it's experimental and I broke it earlier, but you can also do the same with C++. That is, if it doesn't crash, well, it didn't work, but theoretically you, you can add a C++ um, class, which will be instantiated as an object and yeah, be able to be used for that. And I think it will be great at some point to have the same with Rust, but I really don't know how to integrate Rust, for instance, like with this, we, we integrate Clang and build with Clang and metadata software to, to JIT compile C++, will the same thing be doable with Rust? I hope so. And if anyone knows, please ping me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so yeah, and the, the big question is how to buy into the API because, uh, well, there is an extensive C++ API, which is helpful to develop things, but then it makes it, hard, it makes it harder to, to bind to other languages. And yeah, and so this was OSIA score. And then um, LibOSIA is uh, the library which is being used underneath. Uh, so it hides various creative coding protocols behind one single API, which allows to uh, introspect it as you could see in score, but other software use it too. 
Um, and it, it comes with things that are useful for people who make intermediate art. And uh, Libosia is implemented, or it, it has bindings to most um, creative coding environments. Um, so right now, there is a very, very primitive binding of uh, to REST, um, which has been made by external contributors. And um, so it allows to, for instance, to expose operators from a uh, REST um, program, but it binds basically, so Libosia is written in C++. It has a C binding on top of the C++ API, and then uh, the REST traits um, uses the, the C API and not the C++ one. And I think that now there are uh, better ways, uh, with, well, better traits to allow automatic binding generation of C++ code. So I think that ultimately this will be the, the better thing to do or to implement the protocol from scratch in REST. That's also <laughs> something worthwhile, I guess, because the C++ implementation, well, it's network protocol implementation is plus plus. Uh, but as, at least can give some basis. And then the idea is to be able to create those parameters and say, okay, I have this parameter, which is uh, some OSC address. It's of type float. Uh, this one, um, I don't know if there is min, max. Well, there are a lot, a lot of metadata that you can set on your parameters and say, okay, this is what my parameter is. And the more metadata you give and the more separate software can use that metadata to score it and do fun thing with it over the network. Um, so yeah. Um, and otherwise, well, we have max and SQL objects, credit objects, open frameworks, blah, blah, blah. Um, in Spark Lighter, it's been uh, written, written from scratch, I think, because uh, it was too hard to embed native C++ library in Spark Lighter source code. Uh, there is a C-sharp binding. I've been working on an Unreal Engine binding, but it doesn't work perfectly well yet. And um, yeah, um, the idea is that uh, everywhere where you use Libosia, um, it should match how what, what are the idiomatic ways to do in the host environment. So uh, the object, the, the way to do, for instance, in Java, it uses builder pattern because that's what people do there. And um, well, uh, in Rust, I had. I, I don't know if that's idiomatic as I'm not really much of a Rust coder, but um, that's what we strive for, having uh, idiomatic liberation in uh, media systems. And uh, another thing is that we are trying to, to make a way to um, basically write the actual objects in um, as free as uh, possible of any dependency. So if there is this um Avendish project which basically allows to write um object, for instance vst plugins vst3 um let's say a max pd objects and um, the actual code of the object the rule is that it shouldn't have any dependency on anything so we can for instance write this code and say okay these are my, my inputs uh, my outputs are, for instance, I take a float, I uh, return a float, or um, here, for instance, uh, my input is an audio port and uh, with some uh, control and my output is another audio. We perform the computation and all this should be done without depending, I believe, on an existing framework and library. So in C++20, we, we can cheat a bit there. There is just enough reflection to get by. And I wonder if uh, something similar in Rust will be meaningful and this will require defining, you know, so in Splice there is concepts and Rust it's traits that say, okay, uh, this uh, bundle of source code that really looks like an audio processor or a MIDI synthesizer voice or a visual effect processor and let's just parse that at compile time and do compile time stuff with it to create uh, various media objects. And uh, I think I'm... Uh, getting out of time. So um, thanks everyone for listening. I hope this was uh, <laughs> kind of clear. So please start the GitHub repo because uh, as you all know, this is the, the currency on which we feed. We, we feed on GitHub stars and um, you can come and say hi. We have a chat on Gitter forum and uh, uh, 
uh, the website um, OSIA. So you, you can find everything here and download it, use it. It's free open source, do what you want. So thanks. And if there are any questions. Uh, Thank you so much. Oh, there, I could hear myself, but <laughs> all good. I guess it's part of the demo. <laughs> oh, it's because, he, yeah, you have your speakers on so that we could hear yeah, your. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was really cool. Um, yeah, I love the little, like, uh, interesting facts you threw in. Like, I had no idea about the MIDI keyboard limitations. That was pretty oh. cool. No idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we don't have that much time, but someone did uh, leave a question in the chat. Okay, I'll check on the chat. <laughs> um, cool. No, well, I mean, I was going to ask it to you live, if you oh. don't mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so someone asked that, you know, uh, Osea looks really powerful, and they were asking how they could get started, you know, I guess as a first-timer, just wanting to dabble. Yeah, um, so... What what we have so and I, I'll be honest that's the sore point because it, it's really uh, all contributor based. But on the website uh, you can find there is a docs um, tab and we have uh, online tutorials. So it's mostly workshops that we did with artists that were recorded and they explain everything from start to finish. And there is also a documentation. So the documentation comes with some simple case studies like. Pretty much what I did during this talk, like how to um, control the sound, apply an effect on the video, that kind of thing. And then from then, if you're stuck, then come and come on the chat. And there's always some people which are super happy to help and uh, get people started. Cool. So if someone's just wanting to get started, hop on the Gitter and yeah. <laughs> I'm sure yep. they'll be super happy. Uh, thanks again. It was really, really great having you. It was a great talk. Uh, uh, really fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Uh